Sergeant, uh, thanks for coming down to the office today to uh, go over this case. I got your brief uh, a few days ago, and I've had a chance to go through it and have a look at it. Um, in view of the fact that the uh, preliminary hearing is coming up in another week or two, I thought we should uh, spend some time together today, at least in a preliminary way, to go over a few matters. Uh, perhaps if I could just give you my brief initial reaction to the thing after I've had a look at it, uh, it seems to me, after, after one reading of it, that uh, it's probably pretty clear that the, the, the primary theory of the Crown uh, in this matter uh, is going to have to be that death was caused by that second shot uh, that uh, hit this fellow Leakes uh, in the head while he was downstairs, uh, or at least if that didn't cause his death, it at least accelerated uh, death that might otherwise have been caused by that shot that he got uh, in the chest while he was upstairs. Um, seems to me, and I, again, uh, please correct me if your interpretation is wrong, but it seems to me that uh, we may be in a little bit of trouble with a possible defense of self-defense insofar as the shot to the chest upstairs is concerned, and that accordingly it, uh, it's going to be pretty important for us to be able to establish that uh, death, as I say, was either caused by or at least accelerated by the shot to the head downstairs. What I was wondering about uh, initially as well was whether or not we might try and work as much as possible on what uh, we'll call for the moment perhaps a, an alternative theory of the Crown that uh, if we're somehow unable to establish uh, that primary theory, we'd be able to show that uh, the shot upstairs was not fired in self-defense. And um, what's your impression uh, on that question uh, with respect to what happened upstairs and sort of the background of this thing? Uh, are we on solid ground or are we on shaky ground on the question of whether or not uh, there is a defense of self-defense? Well, Rod, <clears throat> I think there are a number of things uh, taken into consideration here. Whether we can get this across to the jury is being another thing. Uh, one is the fact that uh, when these chaps come up the, the night before with a crowbar and uh, put down as kind of a ripoff, uh, this put Adams in a position that he's uh, kind of defaced in front of all of his friends. He's uh, here; they come up into his apartment and rip him off, and he's not going to permit this because he's trying to portray the image that he is the big shot drug pusher in the area and this is why uh, in my opinion he went and bought a gun and he was going to show them they weren't going to get away with it there's a couple other items that uh, the fact that he shot Longfellow at this point in time of course there is no immediate danger they're running from the apartment they're halfway down the stairs and he shoots Longfellow right between the eyes I suppose uh, we can we can try and work on the idea that uh, even though that happened afterwards it uh, it says something about uh, the situation in the apartment a few minutes earlier, right? That's right, and it's all part of the same action. It happened so closely, I don't think they could separate uh, that part of it. <clears throat> There's also the fact that uh, there was no powder residue on, uh, on Leakes' uh, clothing. I would take it from this that uh, he had to be at least further than about five feet away. Are, are you in a position to testify about that, uh, Sergeant? Uh, I was wondering about that. Just, you know, how close would a person have to be in order to have some powder residue on the clothing? Well, I'm not the firearms expert, but I would think anything five feet or closer that I would expect to find residues on his clothing. Another thing I was wondering about, too, is from my reading of it, it doesn't seem to have been a one-on-one -on -one affair. How many of Adam's friends were there in that apartment at that's, the time? That's true. There's about eight including uh, him, there was about eight in the apartment against, uh, at that point in time when the shooting took place, there was only uh, uh, Longfellow and, and, and Leakes, so that it's easy that they could have overpowered him. There was no necessity of just shooting him through the chest. Right. Another the other point was there, Rod, that uh, you know, after he shot Longfellow, he went back into the apartment, opened the window, and shot at uh, two of them, and that had Phillips, and I forget the other chap's name, that, that had left previous to that. One thing that troubles me a bit, though, in that whole area, it seemed to me from reading the statements that, with the exception of Longfellow, aren't we in a position where, where just about every one of the potential civilian witnesses for the Crown is a person who's going to be pretty friendly to Adams? That's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, another area that, that uh, gives me considerable concern is really on this question of cause of death and as it relates to what our, our primary theory would be. Uh, at the preliminary course and, and at trial. Um, in the brief, the, the pathologist uh, at, uh, I think it's at, 
Let me just find the page, uh, page 47 of the brief, uh, Sergeant. Under uh, the heading of cause of death, uh, his conclusion is uh, one that indicates that uh, it was the shot to the chest that he places as the cause of death. Now he, as I read it anyway, he carries on over on uh, pages 49 and 50 and on into uh, 51, and perhaps most importantly, right at the end of page 51, um, he seems to come to the point ultimately that uh, the shot to the head uh, that Leakes uh, suffered would at least have accelerated uh, death that would otherwise have been caused by the shot to the heart. Now, I guess my question of you really is, uh, is the doctor going to stick to that view? Uh, what do you think about it? Well, Rod, I, know, I don't know. My own view was at the time of the pathology in this thing that uh, seeing that shot to the head, I don't think uh, Leakes moved after that shot. <laughs> my opinion, he, he was dead right there. But the doctor tells me that in his experience of many gunshot wounds to the head, that many people survive uh, some pretty bad sh shots to the head. And for this reason, he's reluctant to say, you know, this killed him, uh, as to, you know, tying him down to give an opinion. I suppose we, we might even be troubled by the fact that uh, our witness Longfellow is an example of that. That's correct. Of course, uh, in Longfellow's case, the bullet didn't touch the brain. And in uh, Leakes, it, it uh, disintegrated through the brain. How about this uh, question of accelerating death, though, well, that he's put in, in, in the addendum to his report? Uh, can we count on him to, uh, to stick to that? I'm hoping so. Perhaps we should uh, get together with him and discuss the matter prior to trial. Well, there's another matter then we really should come to uh, in relation to the, uh, the evidence of the pathologist uh, uh, relating to um, what I've just put in my notes after reading your, your brief, uh, is the question of the number of bullets that were involved. Uh, as you know from the pathologist's report, uh, he speaks in terms of there having been three bullet wounds to leaks. And uh, I had some trouble with that. Uh, were you present at the autopsy, Ron? Yes, I was. And uh, this is bothering me, too, because uh, at the time, I recall the, the uh, mark on his, on his chin was like a puncture wound. And it, it certainly would give all appearances of being a gunshot wound. And prior to opening the skull, they had <clears throat> we'd taken x-rays of the skull, and it showed a dark mark on the top of the bridge of the nose, just behind the top of the bridge of the nose. And he immediately formed the opinion that this was a, a gunshot wound to the chin. However, we did take this area out, and it has been examined, and there's no powder residue. Another thing that disturbed me greatly at the time, he could find no uh, damage to the... Uh, upper jaw, or that is the roof of the mouth. So there was, in my opinion, there was no way that the bullet could have got from the chin up to here if they didn't leave some uh, bone damage in between. And he seemed to have disregarded this, and he has this uh, firmly in his mind that this is a third shot. So I think this, again, is another area that we're going to have to consult with them prior to trial. trial. Well, it sort of fits in with, with another problem I had, and that is in reading the, the brief, uh, I get confused about uh, what the Crown evidence really is going to be on the, the question of just how many shots there were fired. Uh, some of the, the witnesses seem to be talking about a number of, uh, of uh, gunshots. Uh, um, and yet, on the other hand, uh, as I understand it, there were five empty cartridges that were recovered. Uh, was That's, there any indication that the gun was, was reloaded at any time? No, there wasn't, Rod. Uh, I must admit that the witnesses seemed to be telling us that there was much, many more shots fired. But I think we're confined to these five shells that was found in the gun because there uh, certainly is no indication they reloaded it. Have you sort of done a, uh, an analysis uh, briefly to uh, try and figure out just where those five shots uh, went, assuming that they were all fired? Well, we've got, uh, obviously, we've got the one in the chest of uh, the deceased leaks and one in the head, for sure. Uh, disregarding the one in the chin, uh, go on, we have uh, one that we dug out of the, uh, the hall floor, or the landing floor between the, the third and the second floor there. And uh, that counts for three. And then we have one in Longworth's head which is four, and then one out the window. Right. Did you ever uh, recover a bullet out of the, uh, the yard outside that front window? Well, we, we took Phillips down, and he indicated almost within a foot to where the bullet landed behind his, his foot. But uh, 
we dug it all up, but we didn't come up with the bullet at all. I was wondering, too, uh, <coughs> Sergeant, in your own statement, uh, I think it's at, uh, let me just find the page, I think it's page 36 of the brief, as part of your uh, statement, uh, you indicate that you, uh, about two-thirds of the way down the page, that you you tagged a Western-type revolver, 22 caliber high standard, along with 37 loaded bullets and five spent shells. Um, and yet the, uh, the report from Mr. Nickel indicates that he, uh, he received, I think, 41 loaded bullets. Um, is there a possible error in the brief there? Yes, that, that should read 41 because the, uh, there was five empties and, and uh, four live rounds in the gun. Uh, plus 37 from his pocket, so this uh, added up to 41 I live see. rounds. Okay. Now, with respect to the civilian witnesses and the statements that are contained uh, in the brief, uh, uh, for example, uh, Frank Williams and, and Goldie Hawes, uh, <coughs> did you take these statements uh, yourself from these people, as I understand it? Yes, I did, Rod. Right. Yeah. And you recall. Uh, I think it's indicated on Goldie Hawes' statement when hers were taken, but with respect to Frank Williams, when was, uh, was that statement taken from him? Oh, well, sometime I interviewed a number of them there between 3 and 5 in the morning. And uh, Would that be the, the early morning right after the, uh, the shooting? That would be Tuesday morning. Right? Tuesday morning then, yeah. And uh, can you just explain to me, in, in case it does become a problem, um, uh, all I've got, of course, now is, is the type, the usual typed, uh, will say, statement. Uh, how did you take those statements, uh, let's say, from, from Williams and Hawes? Well, normally, Rod, I wouldn't have done it in the manner that I did, but uh, we were pretty tired. It was in the middle of the morning. We had a lot of people to interview. So uh, what I did, I took them into a <clears throat> private office in the police station there, and uh, I sat down, and they told their story. And as they told it to me, I, I wrote real rough notes. I mean, they, I used short firms and uh, real rough, just getting the idea of what their story was going to be. And then... Uh, I read this back to them, which they agreed that that's the way it happened. And then I had obtained a small tape recorder from the chief, and uh, from it I, I dictated the story into the tape recorder, and uh, using my notes plus what they told me as we went along. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were done, I played it back, and they agreed that that's, uh, that was their statement. Uh, subsequent to that, I left the tape in the girl's office with a note to have this typed up, typed up as a statement for him. And uh, <clears throat> she then typed the notes up from that. We used the tapes over again. Uh, the rough notes I just threw in the, the uh, ash can there. Uh, about a day later, I guess it was, we brought in the witnesses and we read the statement back to them. They agreed that this was correct and I had them sign it at that time. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to, uh, to Goldie Hawes statement, uh, and I think that's up around page 70 or so of your brief, is it not? Yes, right. Uh, there are just a couple of things about it that I was wondering about. Um, on page 70 there, about a third of the way down the page, where it reads 10 a.m., should that be uh, 10 p.m.? Yes, it should. Uh, should be. And uh, uh, as well, just uh, a little bit... Uh, Further down, there's a reference to uh, somebody by the name of uh, Zeke uh, Roberts. Um, I don't know how that got in there, Rod. It, it should be Henry Adams, anyway. Oh, okay. It should be Henry Adams, I think he's uh, indicated, in place of Zeke Roberts. Now, another point I wondered about was, uh, was over on page 71, uh, just about the fourth line down, um, there's a reference to uh, somebody named Bob. Uh, should, should that be Bruce? Yes, it should. It should be Bruce. Thanks. Okay. Okay, going back, uh, Sergeant, if I could, just for a moment to your own statement. Uh, you've referred uh, throughout that statement to um, uh, Sergeant Bilko of the uh, Woodstock City Police, uh, and yet I don't see a statement uh, in here uh, for Sergeant uh, Bilko. Uh, well, I'm sorry about that, Rod. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I should have put a small note in the front of the brief that uh, that Bilko was killed in a flaming car crash on, uh, I believe it was January the 7th of uh, 1972, and his uh, notebook and everything was burned up at the time. I see. Okay. 
Other than that, though, we have, the, uh, we have all the uh, available witnesses ready to proceed uh, with the preliminary and, of course, thereafter a trial. That's right. With no right. problem, I don't think, Rod. Okay. Just if I could, uh, I may be wrong here, but uh, I had a little bit of a problem with your statement, I think, uh, at about page 38, um, where it refers to uh, your having observed uh, or interviewed, it says, uh, Longfellow, um, at the uh, hospital, um, again, the same, the early morning of Tuesday, December 28th, I think you're talking about, and it says at approximately uh, 12.55 a.m. Um, the way I was reading your statement, I had you, uh, I think, back at the house about that time and wondered how you could be in two yeah, places at one uh, time. Rod, that should be changed around 4 o'clock in the morning. I see. And did you, did you actually interview Longfellow at that time? Was he capable of being interviewed? Uh, well, not really. Uh, I, I saw him, but he's, he was under... Uh, and drugs at the time. I ascertained that he had been shot between the eyes and the bullet had gone through under the brain and was lodged back in the back of his spine. And uh, for the he, president, uh, about all they've done is put a Band-Aid on it. He is uh, alive and well and ready yes, to he's justify he's on behalf okay of the now, Crown in this uh, matter, don't we? That's right, no okay. problem. Okay. And at the bottom of page 38 there, if I read that correctly, uh, you're simply uh, inserting there uh, what Deputy Chief Andrews did. Uh, you weren't present uh, at 1 a.m. Uh, when uh, Leakes was uh, identified uh, by his father at the morgue. No, that's true. All right. Um, with respect to the photographs, uh, we'll have to uh, look at this in more detail when we have another session together uh, before the preliminary, but I had a little problem with what I think is probably just a typographical error, but back on page 13 where there's a list of photographs, um, items uh, two through eight refer to Leakes apartment. Should that be Adam's apartment? Uh, yeah, three, three through to seven in there, I guess, or eight, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> that should be Adam's, right? In any event, all the photographs were with respect to Adam's apartment. That's great. Right. Right. Okay, I just had one more, uh, Sergeant, uh, on page uh, 24 of the brief. Again, I may have misread that, but um, right at the top, um, should that read Sunday, sorry, Sunday, December 26th, uh, rather than Saturday, December 26th, That's 71? Right. That should be Sunday, Ron. Right? Okay. Well, Sergeant, it seems to me to be pretty clear that uh, uh, we have some problems with this pathologist report, and I'm wondering if, um, if you could set up a, an interview uh, with him uh, for you and, and uh, he and I to go over this matter. and. Uh, in fact, in view of the shortage of time that we have today, I think it would probably be a good idea if you and I were to get together for an hour or so before we saw him. So could you set that up for next week to give us uh, lots of time before the preliminary starts? Okay, right. I'll give you a call when I've got it set okay. up. Okay, thank you. Remain in your seats now. We'll move. Mr. Adams, you know my student, David Fairgreave. I believe uh, he spoke to you in jail uh, the night that you were arrested. Right, right, that's right. Um, he uh, took some notes when he was talking to you, and I've, I've had a chance of looking at them, and I'd like to uh, talk to you about some of the things that were in that statement. Um, that night uh, um, was about several hours after you were arrested that he spoke to you. That's right, that's right. And uh, I gather you were very upset and distraught that evening? I think so. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you some general questions about your background and find out a little more about you. Can you tell me uh, um, where you've worked since uh, you left school when you were 16? Yeah, okay, well. Is it on? Bring it closer to you. Bring it closer to you. Okay. What's that? Bring it right up. Bring it right up. Okay. 
Yeah, it was after I left school, I uh, worked uh, almost in part-time stuff in a lot of radio and TV shops around Tilsonburg. Never worked uh, but too steadily, I guess, but steadily enough. How many places would you say you've worked at in the last uh, five years? Well, maybe three or four. And have you done any other work other than radio and television uh, to repair? Well, I did some picking tobacco and done some, some just sort of general short labor jobs to pick up some money here and there. Mm -hmm. I needed some bread, that's what I did. How did you pay for the uh, apartment that you had on Hatch Street? It's not, well, it's, uh, I'd been working picking tobacco in the summer before, and I'd uh, yeah. been working picking tobacco the summer before, and uh, I had a lot left over, a lot of savings from that. Didn't spend much money. You got a, uh, you have a grade 12 education? Yes, sir. <clears throat> from what school? Uh, St. Mary's High School. In Tilsonburg? Yes, sir. And. Um, you also have a criminal record that uh, I've looked at. In 1967, you were convicted of trafficking in a narcotic. What drug was that? It was uh, marijuana. I say, how much? Three or four ounces, I guess. And uh, there's a charge here for, did you plead guilty to that offense? Yes, I did, sir. And this contributing to juvenile delinquency. What, uh, what were the facts uh, involved in that conviction? Well, that was, uh, I was downtown in Tilsonburg, and uh, a girl that I, well, I didn't know her name. I knew who she was. Came up and asked me to buy a bottle of booze for her. So I did. How old was that girl? Uh, I think she was 14. Did you plead guilty to that offense? Uh, yes, I did. <clears throat> and in January of 71, there's a conviction here for possession of a narcotic. What drug was that? That was hash. And um, uh, did you plead guilty to that offense? Yes, I did. I see. Okay. Now, you uh, have said in your statement that you knew Bruce Leakes uh, um, for some brief period of time. Um, were you afraid of him at all? Yeah, oh yeah. And Bruce Leakes was, was really, really a tough character. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew about him. Yeah, I mean, hell, everybody knew about him. Did you know about his record? Yeah, right. He'd been, uh, he'd busted a few guys in the, in the States and was in jail for it. Had, uh, had he been involved in any fights, to your knowledge, in Canada since he'd been well, here? Well, I'd heard quite a bit. I heard that uh, he'd pounded a guy, a few guys, pretty good in Tulsenburg. I knew the guys, too, and they were pretty tough guys. He used to brag about it quite a bit. So, uh, and I knew that he'd been in the Army and <coughs> learned hand-to-hand -hand combat and stuff like that. He used to brag all the time about that. I was what, pretty scared. What about uh, Longfellow? Were you afraid of him? Yeah, Longfellow was, uh, I always get in fights. He was a street fighter. He used to love going out getting in fights. He used to go to bars quite a bit in fights. I gather you're not much of a fighter. <laughs> I'm not like those guys. I'm not in that yeah. class. Well, you mentioned in your uh, statement, uh, <clears throat> now again, uh, it was just notes that were taken down by uh, my student, um, that you were never frightened of leaks till Christmas night of 71. Uh, you're, uh, you're now saying that you, you did have uh, a fear of him. Uh, yeah. Well, like, until Christmas end of 71, I didn't think that, uh, that he was really going to come after me. I mean, I was frightened of him. I knew what he was like, but uh, he'd never done anything towards me oh, yet. So you had no reason until uh, till then to fear him personally. Right, that's right. But you, you did have a healthy respect. <laughs> Damn right. Okay. Now, on Christmas Eve, you've uh, talked about uh, the first visit when Longfellow came and he was... Uh, I take it very drunk when he showed up the yeah. first time. Oh, yeah, he was willing to. <coughs> what was wrong with him? Well, he came in, he was drunk, and he was uh, really loud. And I, I looked at him, and uh, he had a, a badly split lip. He was bleeding. <coughs> and uh, it was really, really a mess. It looked like it was split wide open. And I really couldn't believe that, uh, I mean, by the way he was walking in there carrying on, but to look at him, I wonder where the hell he'd come from like that. Did he uh, tell you what was wrong with him, or did you know? Well, he said, I, I still don't really believe him, I can't believe it. He said that he was at a party, and that some bastard had shot him in the lip. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, with a pellet, I, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that somebody had, could get shot in the lip like that, and have a lip looking like that, and still be this, the way he was, strapping around the apartment like that. Did he tell you who shot him? <sighs> oh, he might have. I, I don't recall any name, anyway, if he did. Was he uh, attacking anybody at the time he was shot? Oh. I don't know. I, 
I mean, knowing him, I'm not surprised if it was, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Now, uh, Leakes was there. Yeah. <coughs> and did they leave together? Yeah, they did. But just about 20 minutes to know, but they said they're going to come back. Oh, were they very good friends? Well, I knew they were acquainted. Uh, I, I, they'd hang around together a bit. They'd, uh, I'd seen them together. Did they tell you they were coming back? Yeah, they said they're, they're, they're going to be back in a while. I told them, you know, I, God, this was well after midnight, I guess, well, a little after midnight. And we'd been up all day, Christmas Day, and we wanted to go to bed. So I told them that I didn't want them to be too long because I didn't want them making all kinds of noise. This is a rooming house, too. We've got neighbors. Yeah. Okay. Well, they came back, and right. um, what, uh, what was Leakes carrying with him when he came back? He had tire iron, okay. tire iron in his hand when he came back in. And Longfellow, what did he have? Longfellow had... Uh, Sort of a wooden, wooden handle of some sort. I, I wasn't quite sure where it was from. It was broken at the end. Um, did they do anything with those uh, weapons? Well, they came in. They were swinging them around. See, when Longfellow came in, he started hassling me again about this uh, money he said I owed him, and, and he kept saying that he wanted money. And they, uh, they were swinging them around. I knew what the hell they were doing. I mean, it was perfectly clear to me. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, they wanted some money from you. Yeah, they wanted the money. Uh, if you hadn't have given them the money, uh, what do you think would have happened to you? I think I would have got the shit kicked out of me. Okay. Um, you gave them how much? I gave, well, I, I gave them my wallet. I had $20 <laughs> in the wallet. So I kept telling them I didn't have very much money. It was Christmas. I gave them my wallet, $20 in it. He just took the $20 out and threw the wallet on the floor. They left. And were you scared? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Really, really scared. Did you sleep that night at all? Yeah, after a while. I, well, I was really upset for a long time. I was really, really upset because, I mean, this has been going on for a long time, right? I've been having this trouble with him, this argument, and the same, the, and the same way every time. He always ended up getting the money because he always ended up, you know, I knew he was going to beat me up. Is that the first time anybody tried to uh, uh, shake you down in that way with using weapons? Yeah, right. <clears throat> That's, uh, I mean, he never had a weapon before. <clears throat> Anytime he ever done it before, it was always just, you know, it was as if I knew he was going to beat me up with his fist, but this time, they, you know, and they were serious. Okay. What did you do the next day? Well, Brian O'Malley, who was staying with us, had a friend in London that we told me about, named Art, and he told me that Art had a revolver. So we drove to London, and I borrowed it from Art, I borrowed the gun, and then we drove back <coughs> to, uh, to Woodstock, took the gun up to the apartment. Okay. Has O'Malley got a criminal record? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. And did you know uh, this fellow Art before? No, no, he was a friend of Brian's. I don't know who he was. Yeah, I take it when you say you were borrowing the gun that you were going to give it back to him at yeah. some time. No, yeah, well, see, I only wanted the gun because, I mean, I got tired. I mean, Longfellow had been shaking me down for so goddamn long. I've been going through this mm -hmm. and coming into my apartment in the middle of the night. And when they came in with the weapons, I just knew that there was no way that I was going to put any fear into him where they were going to stop unless, unless they knew I had the gun. So I figured if they found out I had the gun, then that was all I'd need. That'd be, I could give the gun back. Okay. Now you had uh, some 22 caliber bullets in your apartment, correct? Yeah, I'd had them there for, I guess, about a month or so. How did you get them? Well, well, I guess about a month before then, I'd gone hunting with a friend of mine uh, from Tilsonburg who'd come up, and uh, he brought, I, I don't own a gun, but he brought up some uh, uh, two rifles and, uh, and some bullets, and he, he left the bullets behind in the apartment, 22 caliber bullets. What's your friend's name? Ron Thompson. Where does he live? Uh, 190 Bryan Avenue in Tilsonburg. Okay. And he'd uh, be available to talk to me about this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure he would. Okay. I'm sure he would. Very good. Does he have a criminal record? No. No. Okay. Is he working? Yeah. Right now he's working. Fine. Now, um, you brought the gun back to your apartment, and um, it appears that Goldie didn't know about it. Um, why didn't you tell her? Well, you know, I didn't want to upset her. I mean. I was hoping that, that she'd never have to find out that they even had it. I didn't want to upset her, didn't want to, you know, create that sort of situation. I knew that she wouldn't like it very much, because she was kind of scared of everybody, too. And well, The whole situation was kind of building, you know, I mean, this was a pretty frightening thing. Did you tell uh, Brian O'Malley why you were getting the gun? I think I probably told him that I, you know, that just, like, just like I said to you, that, that I wanted to put some fear into these guys. For, for, for the protection. I just, you know, like, I mean, they're coming right into my house. Okay. Like they own it. Well, I take it that you must have thought they were coming back. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, he'd been back 
several times before, and <coughs> we'll shake down things. So. Okay. When they were there the uh, first time, and they were swinging these uh, tire irons and wooden handles at you, the uh, the atmosphere was very tense, I take it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did they uh, say anything about uh, harming you? Well, not so much. It's more or less, it was sort of just, you know, like, you better give us the money, you owe us the money, you know what's good for you. Yeah. How do you want to end up? Okay. Well, when you got the gun home, um, you mentioned that you loaded it and put, uh, I believe you said it, that you had put <clears throat> at page seven, you mentioned something about uh, eight, uh, eight bullets in yeah. the chamber. It, it, it appears that uh, um, from the police report that there were, in fact, nine chambers in this gun. Um, uh, do, you, do you remember, or did you just load the gun, or what did you do? I, don't, I didn't count the bloody thing. I loaded the gun. I put one in every chamber. I thought there were eight. Okay. Yeah, if they say it's nine, then it was nine. I don't know. I think so. Okay. Where'd you put the gun when you got home? Well, when I first got it there, on, on the mm -hmm. Sunday night when I came home, I put it in, uh, in the <coughs> bottom drawer of the dresser in Goldie and I's room, right in the bottom. I had some heavy sweaters down there. Well, who, who, the whose dresser is that? Is that, is that bottom drawer? Is well, that the your bottom drawer? drawer is where I keep all my heavy sweaters. And Goldie doesn't go there? No, not normally. Well, see, that's what I thought when I put it there. But then I got to thinking later that night that, you know, it's, it's wintertime, and sometimes she puts on my, you know, like a sweater or something of mine, even though it's too big for her, and sits around the house. So I decided I'd better move it because I didn't want to find it. So the next day I took it and I put it in the, uh, in the vegetable bin of the refrigerator. Does, uh, d does, does Goldie not uh, go to the vegetable bin at all? Or no? no, no. She, uh, there were a lot of cans of stuff back there. Actually, we use it for canned goods. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have very many fresh vegetables in the place, right. and uh, I was convinced that she wouldn't go there anyway. So Besides, it would be more convenient. I figured that if, if, if I ever wanted to pull it out and ever needed it, that that would be the best place for it to be. Okay. You were confident that Goldie wouldn't, uh, wouldn't see it. Right. Okay. And you didn't want to scare her? That's right. About the gun. That's right. That's okay. right. Uh, had you told Goldie about what had happened when Longfellow and Leakes were there and threatened you in that fashion? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I, I told everybody that it was in the house, I guess, next morning when we got up. It sort of, you know, I told them that what had happened. Okay. It's a pretty frightening thing. Oh, I'm sure. When the, when they, when the four of them came uh, to your apartment, um, um, I take it you weren't expecting them. Is that correct? No, not at that time. Okay. No, I knew they'd come back someday, but not right then. Okay. You were playing the, the guitar with, with Williams? Yeah, I was sitting at the kitchen table, uh -huh. and Williams was always over in the chair just opposite me there, and, and we were sort of playing around, and there was a big pounding at the door at that point. And, uh, Goldie, where was Goldie at that time? Goldie was having a bath at that time. Okay. And I think Bob Mitchin answered the door. He went to look at the people. He said, uh, it's Dan, they're back. And Christ, I just right away, I just <laughs> dropped like a shot and ran right to the fridge. and. Uh, and, and pulled the gun. I was still in the holster in the other vegetable bin, and I went and stood in the hallway there, just at the back. I couldn't see what was going on in the living room. And what happened? Well, I was standing there for a few minutes. I heard all this panic going on in the living room. They came charging in. I didn't. I I could tell it was Longfellow's voice at that point, and I was just standing there. And all of a sudden, uh, Pat Kelly came flying around the corner from the living room, and I just about jumped a foot in the air, and I pulled the gun out of the holster and threw it in the floor and just sort of stood there and yelled at him to get back. You didn't, you didn't expect Pat Kelly, did you? <laughs> no, okay. no, I certainly didn't. Is he got a, a, a record for assaults? Or? I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I mean, at that time, it was just, yeah, I mean, I was really nervous. He came back. So I told him to get back. Well, tell me, is, is, is Pat Kelly considered a very tough fighter at all? Or? Well, he's not like the other two. He's not like Leeks and Longfellow, let's put it that way. What was he doing with them, did you know? No, I didn't know. I, I didn't know why, why he was there. He was totally unexpected. I never would have guessed that he'd be coming up with them. Okay. But in any event, there, were the, there was this gang of four that, uh, that were there. Right. And um, um, Kelly, what did he do? Well, you know, he, he saw me standing there. He <clears> says, <throat> I just want to go to the John. I just want to go to the John. And, and I, I said, you can't. Goalie's in there. And I said, get out again. I told him to get out. And I started coming forward, and he saw the gun. And he said, ah, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. I think he better use that. And, you know, he didn't really believe, I guess, that, that I was serious at all. But and you were, you were pointing a gun at him? And he well, sort of pointing it in front of me towards the floor mm -hmm. a bit and sort of waving it maybe a bit. And I started to walk forward, and he backed up into the living room. I came out just out sort of where the start of the living room is. What did he say to you when you, were, when you had this gun at him? He said, uh, 
that I'd better use that thing or, or else I wouldn't have another chance or something, something along those lines, you know. So you mean he didn't, uh, he didn't act uh, frightened at all about <laughs> no, you? No, no, he didn't, you know, like, which made me even more nervous because, well, uh, you know, like they weren't, uh, you know, they weren't too afraid of me at that point. Well, I'm sure. Well, um, so you were, you were scared at that time. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, what happened at that time? Well, I walked out to the living room, just to where it starts, and, and uh, I saw Longfellow standing in the middle, and Peter Phillips was up there too, and Leach was standing over by the door there with his hands in his pockets, just sort of pacing back and forth, and, I, and so I told him again, get the hell out of here, you know, get out of my house, you can't come stomping at this. Then Longfellow noticed that I had the gun, and so Longfellow said something like, uh, you're holding all the aces now, and you better play your cards, and, and, and they're all heckling me. I mean, I'm standing there with the gun. And so I pulled the hammer of the gun back. We're still pointed down. I let them know that I was serious and waving around, but they didn't seem to, uh, to be scaring them all. I mean, nobody made any motion to move at all at this point. They were staying there. So I didn't know were what to do. Uh, were you getting more and more frightened? Yeah, well, I mean, I, mean, I got the gun so, so that they'd leave. And, you know, but I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do at that point. Okay, well, then. I gather Goldie came out. Yeah, yeah, Goldie came out. I, uh, Longfellow and I were arguing when Goldie came out. We were arguing the same damn thing about that fucking shakedown all over again. Is, is, that, that, is, that, is that the words they were using? Or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Goldie came out and, uh, oh, shit, we were arguing about the shakedown, and, and he said, we didn't rip you off, we didn't rip you off, and she said, <coughs> uh, yes, you did, you cocksucker, you ripped us off. And uh, it was... It was uh, it was pretty rough, mm -hmm. pretty rough language. Okay. But it's normal. Okay. Yeah. The um, uh, Goldie said something to Leeks, I gather. Yeah, well, she, she, uh, she came out, and, and after she led into Longfellow, she turned over to Leeks, who was standing over there on the side, mm -hmm. and she said, uh, you know, how can you do this? How can you be on his side after we took you in? We fed you, we sheltered you, we uh, we'll let you cry on our shoulder. And then she said, uh, yeah, and this is the thing. She said to him, I hope your daughter's name rots in hell. Mm -hmm. My God, you should have seen. Just, 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 he just stopped dead, pulled his hands out of his pockets, and just, I, I have never seen a look in somebody's face like I saw in Bruce Leake's face right then. Tell me, were, were, have you ever in your life ever been as afraid as you were at that moment? Never, never. I mean, I, 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 he, I knew, I knew that he was going to kill somebody. I just knew it. His, he looked like an animal. What did he do? He did? Yeah. He started coming across the room. He had, had both his arms out. He had sort of, just holding them up, just sort of swinging them like this. And he was coming across, not, not really fast, not really so, very, like, like he knew exactly what he was doing, coming straight at her, stalking her. And he came out towards her, and so she backed up. And so I yelled at him, stop, you know, get back, Leeks, get back. He just kept on coming, kept on coming. So, were you, what were you doing? Were you backing up? Well, not right away. First of all, Golden <coughs> ran behind me. And then I yelled at him, and then, and then he, as he kept on coming, he took about two steps, and he and just wasn't going to stop. And I started backpedaling a bit myself. So Goldie was behind me, and I was standing there, and we we're backpedaling. I kept yelling at him, stop, and he didn't stop. And so I, I, I took the gun. I was still pointed down at this point. I didn't have a point at him. And I held it up with both hands like this in front of me. And I said to him, stop. And he just kept right on coming. And so then I... Were you I, moving, I, I, were you moving my, back? Yeah, were you I'm moving, moving back. back. Yeah. And I had my thumb on the hammer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I took it off the hammer, you know, because, you know, like, like <laughs> trying to tell him, this is it, you know, like, I don't want to shoot you. Mm -hmm. So I was backing up, and, and oh, God, I, you know, like, I knew. He, he just sort of raised his hand, something like this, as if he's going to grab out like this. And just about then, as we're backing down, the refrigerator's at the end of where we were <clears> backing, and I hit it, and I knew. I mean, there was no place else to go. We couldn't back up anymore. I just, he's maybe three feet away, and I squeezed. I just squeezed, and the gun went off. Well, tell me, uh, I know things were happening very quickly, but when you, when you backed into the uh, refrigerator, yeah. did you have your arm extended at all? Well, like, it was sort of like this, with both arms, yeah, you know, like both elbows out at the side, I guess, and the gun right in front of me. Did that, uh, by hitting the refrigerator, did that cause the gun to go off? No. <laughs> no, no, I, you know, like when I hit the refrigerator, I knew I just couldn't back up anymore, and it was, you know, like it startled me to be there. Uh -huh. But I squeezed it. I squeezed the trigger. Yeah. So you're sure about that? that yeah. That no, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, you shot uh, and it hit leaks. Now, he, uh, he then left the room. After I, just after I pulled the trigger, I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened, except I saw him 
I remember the next time that I saw him, which was at the second floor landing. I guess they all ran out. I don't know. I was... That's almost blank in my mind what happened right there. Tell me, has anything ever happened to you that was this tense, or had anything ever in your past ever put you in this kind of state of mind no. before? No. I, uh, no, never. Just nothing like this, ever. Okay. Well, that day, uh, Goldie said that you took some speed, and I think Frank Williams said it around 8 o'clock, yeah. you took some speed. That's right. Um, how often did you take speed in any normal day? Twice a day, usually. For how long? How many months had you been taking speed? Well, I, I, I mean, I was in jail for a while. I wasn't doing any there. I guess pretty well regularly for the five or six months since I've been out. Okay. Just about every day. Well, this day, had you had, uh, had, you had speed, as yeah. Frank Williams said, at 8 o'clock? Yeah, right at 8 o'clock. At night. night. And uh, when did you have uh, another, uh, what do they call it, a hit of, hit of speed? Yeah. Did you have a second one after 8 o'clock? No, no, just the one of these, 8 o'clock in the evening. Did, did you have a second one that day at all? Yeah, well, earlier in the day, mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't know, maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Well, at this time when um, Leeks has now left the room, I, I gather you must have been very terrified? Or? Well, yeah. I, 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 the next thing I remember is I'm standing on the top of the stairs, and, and there's Bruce Leeks down on the second floor landing. He's sort of half crouched, right? Like, mm -hmm. like he's hurt. And Longfellow's just near the bottom of the stairs with him. And I, I just remember just, oh, the whole thing was just totally unreal. Yeah. That well, what did Longfellow, when he was down the stairs, uh, did Longfellow do anything? Or? Well, he sort of got to the landing, and then he, and he turned around and looked back up at me. Did he say anything? No, but he just started coming back up the stairs. Were you, were you scared of him? I was terrified of him. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, you I thought it was all over. I mean, well, this whole thing was just like the end of the world to me. And what did you do? Uh, well, I fired once to warn him to, to stay down. And I fired down at the floor, down below his feet. And he, he just kept on coming, kept coming up the stairs. And so then I, I pointed that towards his head and I fired. Hit him right in the center of the face. Right. How far up the steps do you think he would have been? Maybe two steps, two steps. He just, he turned and he started to come and I fired. He just sort of hesitated and then he kept on coming. Right. Like that. So after you, after you fired the bullet, he still kept coming? Yeah, right, okay. yeah. Now, you left uh, the apartment um, and um, something happened downstairs. Yeah. Now, we, uh, we have a pathologist who, um, who will testify that Leakes died um, as a result of that uh, first shot in the chest, and that uh, our pathologist will testify that um, he was dead at the time of that, that second, uh, second shot when you were down on the first floor. Now. You were stepping over him? Yeah, when right. You got down uh, there? Um, how, what was your state of mind at that time? Oh, shit. I mean, this is a, you know, I, I, I've never seen a dead body before. Never. I mean, not even in funeral homes. I've never seen a dead body. I could just, I, I don't know. I was, I, I just about shit my mm -hmm. pants when, when I was going over. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're, we'll, uh, at, at some stage, we're going to have to, um, talk about some of the language you use. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry. No, no, it's, 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 all, it's all right in, 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 this, in this interview, but uh, before we go to trial, of course, we'll have to... Uh, Certainly, sir. I'm we'll sorry. have to have a discussion about uh, the right, proper way of, of sure. saying some of the things that... Right. Uh, unless those were the exact words that you said at the time. Well, that's um, what I thought. Yeah, well, if you, if you thought that, we'll... <clears throat> okay. But, um, well... If our pathologist, um, his opinion is, is that um, Leakes was dead at the time of the second shot. Um, is it possible? Uh, is it possible that you're wrong about what happened when you were leaving that first floor uh, uh, door? Well, like I mean, I came down. I thought he was dead. I mean, I came up to the body because I remember Goldie had said to uh, Ed Lucas, the landlord, call an ambulance. And uh, I kept thinking, well, you know, this is absurd. Why call an ambulance? He's dead. And when I got up to the body, I thought he was dead. And, and I was pushing Goldie through the door. And, I, uh, and like I said, man, this was really, really horrible. I mean, this guy's dead there. And I was stepping over him, and I had to wriggle through the door because it only opened 10, 10 inches because he was right up against the door. And I was just stepping over him. 
and I guess I had my, on my left foot over, over the body and my right foot was still behind, and all of a sudden I felt some pressure down on my heel. I looked down, I saw his hand right down there at my heel, and oh, Christ, I mean, I, mean, I thought he was dead. And then, and, then, and then the hand, that's why, like I said, I almost, you know, whatever, what, I, what I said. Okay, so you, you thought he was alive. Yeah, at that point, yeah, could be, you know, like, and that's why it was so frightening. Mm -hmm. it's, it's because the dead man was all of a sudden alive. Okay. Well, um, when you got to the station later that, uh, that evening, um, did you say anything to the effect that uh, I finally got rid of that bastard or the son of a bitch had it coming? Did you say anything no, like that? No, no, nothing like that. Nothing. You, um, um, I have to tell you something now that, uh, um, and I don't want it to come as any surprise to you, but I, I've had a chance of reading the Crown information, and um, I've had a brief uh, preliminary discussion with Crown Counsel on the case. Uh, uh, it appears that uh, there may be some, some room uh, for a uh, discussion with the Crown Attorney <clears throat> on this case. Um, uh, towards plea of guilty to manslaughter. Um, now, uh, I'm only raising this at this time. I'm not, uh, you know, there are no guarantees that the Crown Attorney would uh, would possibly take that kind of a plea on a charge of murder, but um, he may be open to that suggestion if I were to discuss it with him. And I would think that uh, it may be possible to uh, uh, to talk in terms of a range of sentence with the Crown Attorney of around uh, six to nine years, before, before you shake your head, no, I'd, I'd like you to hear me out. Um, now, if, uh, if he would agree to that, if he would agree to something in that range, again, the, we, we, the trial judge would have the absolute right to impose a sentence, but my experience is, is that if a Crown Attorney were to recommend a sentence of somewhere between six and nine years, given his knowledge of all the facts, that a judge may well um, listen to the Crown Attorney, and this one is a very responsible uh, excellent Crown Attorney who, uh, who, if he were to recommend that kind of a sentence, might have a strong influence on a trial judge. Um, I'd like to get uh, uh, your view on it to go ahead and have this discussion at this stage. Uh, no way. Just, this, no way. There's this shit. I mean, what the hell did I do? I mean, for, 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 for Christ's sake. <laughs> I mean, the guy was going to kill my wife and maybe me too, and I shot him. What the hell? Mm -hmm. No way. Okay. No way. Okay. Well, um, we'll meet again. And, uh, 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 <laughs> did you have any speed today? <laughs> uh, okay. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Adams, and we'll uh, uh, we'll set up an appointment very soon. <laughs>